Welcome. My name is Peggy Crawford, and I'm Professor of Finance and Chair of the Department of Accounting and Finance at the Grazia Dio School. Today we'll be holding an interview for the Grazia Dio Business Review. We have a great topic and a great group, and I'd like to introduce them to you right now. To my immediate right is Patrick Frutal, and he is a partner of SCCO International based in Los Angeles. Next is Steve Cha. Steve is Senior Advisor to SCCO International and an Adjunct Professor at Pepperdine's Grazi Dio School, and an excellent one, I might add. And next is John Paglia. John is an Associate Professor at Pepperdine's Grazi Dio School, where he teaches corporate finance, valuation, and capital market courses, and also directs the Pepperdine Private Capital Markets Project. Today we have a topic that is really quite hot right now, not only because of what we've been going through over the last few years in the economy, but because of the current presidential uh, race. So we'll be talking about CEO performance and the idea that not everyone deserves a medal. This is in cooperation with uh, SCCO International and Pepperdine University. So John, could you start out by telling us a little bit about this relationship, how it developed, and what we're doing here. So earlier this year, we partnered with SCCO to deliver the 2011 CEO Performance Rankings, which is a performance-based ranking of CEOs and companies in terms of their ability to create economic value. In April, we released the Southern California Report, which included the rankings of 100 companies. The winner was Stephen Chazen, CEO of Occidental Petroleum, who led his company to the top spot by creating $3.4 billion in economic profits. The full report can be downloaded at gbr.pepperdine.edu. And today, we're releasing the CEO Performance 125, which evaluates the performance of 125 CEOs from companies based in Northern California. Great, that sounds very interesting. Steve, uh, what's the approach used to rank CEOs? Sure. First off, thanks Peggy for the nice introduction. Mm -hmm. You know, as we went through this ranking, one of our goals was we really wanted to make it performance-based and differentiate CEO performance. You, you mentioned earlier the title, you know, there's meaning behind that title, not everyone deserves a medal. And that's really what we wanted to accomplish w with the ranking. So what we did is took a step back and said, Really, the CEO's primary duty is to allocate capital to its highest and best use. And so what does that really mean? That's a finance term or finance saying. Um, it's taking the company's resources, that's money, but it's also people and their time, and putting them to their best use. And they have a number of projects that they can choose from, you know, that's going to tie to their strategy. Do they want to do acquisitions? Are they going to go on a growth strategy? Do they, are they looking to take out costs? Are they going to put a new, build a new plan or do a joint venture of some sort? So they have all these decisions to make about how they're going to allocate the resources, and so we wanted to take a look and say, what was the output of that, or what were the results of that? And so what we decided to look at was their ability to earn returns on those investments. And we wanted to compare those with what investors expected. So really we were taking a look at how did they perform, what were the returns that they generated, and then how did that compare to what investors expect. And we talk about what investors expect, a common term that from the finance side is cost of capital, and really what that means is, you know, what kind of return should the investors get for the risk that they took. And so really, to kind of cut to it, out of the 125 companies, the average cost of capital is around 8%. So when you're looking at the companies in the 125, you know, really we're seeing did they get an 8% return or not. And really, where that gets interesting, and the key point, and we'll go into this in a lot more detail, is that the companies that are earning a return above that 8%, are being valued by the market two and a half times higher than those that don't. So I think the market also believes in that not everyone deserves a medal, they differentiate as well. And, and that came through um, you know, very clearly in the results here. Well, that's good to know. So the market is evaluating mm -hmm. on the basis of how CEOs are actually performing and giving rewards for that. Absolutely. Patrick, tell us a little bit about the rankings. Who's the winners? Sure. I'm, I'm going to, Peggy, uh, I'm going to talk to some, some background. What are the definitions? What is economic profit? Mm -hmm. What is value spread? Those are the two uh, dimensions that we rank companies on uh, in the ranking. And then I'll go ahead and talk about the winners. So let me start out with, with what is economic profit. 
And I would refer to, to the first uh, slide. Um, economic profit is a, it's actually a very simple concept. If you look at the slide, you can see that we have uh, <clears throat> sales of 2,000, operating expenses of 1,600. Um, the difference would be EBIT or operating profit. Uh, we then subtract taxes in our example, it's 160. Uh, and we're left with after-tax profit of 240. And, and most people would say, you know, that's what most companies are focused on is growing profit. And investors absolutely want uh, companies to grow profit, but they care about one more thing, which is how much capital did they have to invest in the company to generate that profit. So accounting profit doesn't capture that, but from an economist's viewpoint, you need to subtract uh, a charge or the opportunity cost of that capital. I think it was uh, Peter Drucker who said that no profit is earned until all costs are covered, including the cost of capital. And in our example, that's what's left over after subtracting the capital charge of 100 is economic profit of 140. In an economist's view, that's the true profit. If I could turn your attention to, to the second slide, where we list. I mean, these are, these are the top and the bottom. Um, and perhaps no surprise that, that at the top of the Northern California ranking is a company called Apple. Uh, <laughs> Apple generated 25.4 billion um, of economic profit, and that is profit in excess of the minimum profit or the capital charge on the capital invested in the business. If you look down the list, you also see other technology companies. You see Intel, Google, and Oracle, but you see one company that's not, and it's Chevron. Well, Chevron, of course, is, is, an, is a petroleum company, um, and they've generated economic profit of $19.2 billion. Again, that's profit above their minimum opportunity costs that investors would expect them to earn. And just to dimension that, they have $108 billion of capital invested. Um, you know, so they're able to, to beat that requirement and add profits on top of that. Uh, so, quite, so quite impressive. Mm -hmm. um, the other names you see there are Intel, Google, and Oracle that, that you probably are not surprised to see. And one thing I'll say is that economic profit is somewhat size biased. Uh, because it has to do with how big of a company you are can probably generate more absolute profit. Um, and that's why, that's why we also decided to include value spread. Um, so I would turn to, to the example on the definition slide, the third slide on value spread. Um, value spread is, is simply the amount of profit a company generates above its required profit. But it's a ratio, it's a percentage. So you can think of it as the return on capital minus the cost of capital. And so all companies can be compared because it's really, it's a measure of efficiency excluding the, the size of the company. And in our example, if you look at it, we, the picture on the left, is what is the value spread? You can see the, the top red line is the return on capital and it kind of goes across from, from about um, 17, 18, it, it dips and then goes back up and the tan line at the bottom is, is, the, is the cost. And the shaded red area is the value created. So to the extent that a company is generating returns above its cost, it's, it's generating value. Um, and, and it's interesting to note, and this is really telling about the Northern California companies that we looked at, is that, it, and it says in the box on the right, that the average value spread was 13%. So that means they're earning 13% above the required return. Who's winning in terms of value spread? And I would, I would turn your attention to slide four, the top and bottom five. So, so on the top, once again, we have Apple. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple is earning return, uh, or a value spread, a return above the cost of capital of 1,049%. Pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty impressive. Um, we also have NetApp, and now you can see, these are technology companies, so 533%. And just to be clear, that means for every dollar of capital that's invested, they have an annual return of $5.33. Aruba Networks, Advanced Micro Devices, again, we saw their um, Intel and the top economic profit. Well, it turns out AMD has a higher spread return, value spread, and Riverbed Technology. 
Yeah, it's very, very impressive what Apple's been able to do. You know, not only did they, you know, land in a top spot on economic profit, but also in the value spread. It's, uh, it's very rare and it's extremely difficult for a company, you know, particularly with the size of Apple, to, uh, to win the uh, lead position on, on value spread, given, you know, the necessity of really being able to uh, earn very efficient and productive returns on, on that capital invested. Absolutely. Uh, at that scale. It's unpre unprecedented. Uh, so, Steve, I understand that you took a closer look at performance between companies exceeding the investor expected mm -hmm. return and those that didn't. What can you tell us about this? Sure. So we wanted to get a better understanding of the performance and the importance of returns in the 125 companies that we looked at. So we just did a quick segmentation. We broke them into two groups. We had group one, which were companies earning returns above their cost of capital, that 8% number that we talked about. And then group two were companies that weren't hitting their cost of capital, so they were performing below that. The, you know, the big number that we talked about was the, the market to book multiple. They were being valued two and a half times higher than the market. But we also wanted to look at, kind of from a performance perspective, some of the other metrics. So the, on page six, we have those laid out. So the, you can see the highlights there for the 85 companies in the market to book multiple. You know, but the other one on the page that really stands out is from a profit margin perspective. Those companies in group one, their average profit margin is 10%. For group two, their average profit margin is 0%. So if you're a group two company, for those companies, having an average profit margin of 0%, something's going to need to change. They're not going to be able to continue to, uh, to build the business. You know, just seeing the difference between group one and group two companies and uh, that significant outperformance by group one. Uh, and interestingly, these results are also consistent with what we observed in the Southern California ranking uh, when we uh, did the ranking of the, the top 100. In fact, what we found is that uh, valuations were higher by about uh, 2.5 times. We also saw higher returns, and uh, similar to here, we saw that uh, there was more profitable growth by those companies in that Tier 1 category. So uh, it becomes very clear that you know, all CEOs should be focused on trying to hit that, you know, uh, group one uh, segment. A couple of last questions for the sure. group. Uh, what are the desired takeaways uh, for companies regarding these rankings? Steve, why don't we start with you? So what we covered today in the ranking was a lot of the numbers and how companies have performed. But really what's most important, and hopefully this is the takeaway that companies get, are the behaviors that drive those returns. Because in order to have sustainable results, which is really what we want to see, we're certainly we're talking about a one-year performance ranking here, but what we really want to see is companies that are able to do it year after year. And companies that are able to do that have the CEOs in place are building organizations where people are making decisions that are aligned with their strategy and they drive value. So that when we talk about driving value, it's what we talked about today, making sure that you're delivering returns above your cost of capital. And you know, it's easy from the finance side or the strategy side to make that sound very complicated, but when we talk to organizations or when I've been on the corporate side, and even you know when I'm teaching here at Pepperdine as well, what I talk to people about is really understanding three things or asking yourself three questions. What did we invest? What did we get for that investment? So that's the profit that we got. And did what we received compensate us for the risk of the investment? If you can take that framework in, you don't have to have a solid understanding of all the numbers behind it or how all the mechanics work, but if you have that framework and you're looking at decisions and you're going through that, those steps, one, you know, the one, two, three, um, you'll end up with better decisions across the organization. Good. John, let's look forward. What's the future? Yeah, looking ahead, you know, we're very excited about this relationship with Steve and Patrick and SCCO International, and we look forward to continuing this relationship. Uh, looking ahead next year, uh, we have plans to once again do the Southern California, Northern California CEO performance rankings. Uh, we're very excited about that. You know, we want to better understand the major drivers and behaviors, as, as uh, Steve was mentioning, of value creation and develop more of a research piece around this to better understand and, and codify, to document uh, many of these behaviors and use that as an opportunity for improvement for companies going forward. And I think that all of this also ties very nicely into uh, the learning experience within the classroom. For those of you uh, who will join us to watch the interview uh, for the Graziadio Business Review, 
And for the latest on our research and analysis of business and management, please visit our site, gbr.pepperdine.edu. Thank you.